the One Two Football Podcast. The voices of tomorrow here today. Hey guys, welcome to the brand new weekly One Two Football Podcast here with co-founders Ollie Barefoot, hi, and Kieran Horn. Yeah, you alright? I'm Nathan Smith and we'll be talking about all things football, starting with the three hottest topics in the Premier League. Right, we're starting off right down at the bottom, the bottom half. I mean, we kind of all know that Fulham and West Brom are probably going down, aren't they, really? I mean, it's interesting to see, though, who is going to be the third team that goes down. Who do you guys reckon? Because you've got Burnley have struggled, Sheffield United are struggling. Brighton maybe even sleepwalk their way into this. I mean, Kieran, who have you got right now to go down for? I, I think it, it would have been definitely between Burnley and Sheffield United, and they both did lose most recently. But it was against you know the tradi- two of the traditional big six, and they both put up one hell of a fight. Like Sheffield United really took the game to Liverpool, and from from watching the entire Burnley Spurs game, they did not make it hard for for um, Mourinho. Um, but that that's what you know you're getting into at Burnley. And I, I think the fact that they have that mentality and they have the, the style of play, that it works so well for them, I just I can't see them going down. I really can't. They have, they've almost established themselves as a Premier League mainstay club in that the way they play, yes, it's not the most attractive, but it's effective for the players they have. Chris Wood and Ashley Barnes, <laughs> let's be honest, they, it's very unlikely they would fit into any other team. But the way they play is just, it's so important to how to how those strikers play their game. So I, I can't see it being Burnley. Sheffield United would be a huge shock, you know, going from finishing in the top half last season, being in the top six for the majority of the of the season. I, at the moment, I'd have to say it's them. They just they just seem to be struggling to score goals. Um, yeah, so no, I think, int- yeah. It's interesting with Burnley because while they have got such a strong mentality that has kept them up for so many years, I'm not even kept them up, but you know they've not even fought. When you're talking about relegation battles, Burnley rarely ever entered a conversation. They've been that good, and consider the team's pretty, you know, on paper pretty average. But then, but they made how many signings did they make this summer? None. One. Maybe? I think it was um, Dale Stevens. They brought in Dale Stevens. That was their only signing. So, Ollie, when a team and a manager who's clearly unhappy with the recruit- recruitment like Sean Dyche. How does how does that affect Burnley? What we consider strong team, I mean, they finished top half last season. Do you think that that is having a genuinely huge effect right now on their season? Managers always look to improve their squad. Every manager will tell you you can never get the perfect squad. You've always got to build on what you got because what could have been the best team last season could easily fall down to one of the worst the next season. It's all about investing into the squad and keeping it fresh and keeping it lively. So. A manager always wants that money to be given to him, that, that sort of treasure to be able to spend and get that, that ideal signings. But when a manager can't get them signings, it's going to have a negative effect on them as a manager. I mean, it's obvious to see at many clubs when they get frustrated they can't make signings. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer United, Sean Dyche here. Um, so, I mean, if a manager's unhappy, it's going to have an effect on the players. And a manager's always going to be upset if they can't get the players they want. Exactly. And, and the other team that I mentioned, Brighton, um, I've got two more teams really who I consider possibly going down. I've got Newcastle and Brighton, but Brighton's the most interesting because how many games have we seen Brighton play, especially against the big teams, have been like, they're so impressive. Graham Potter's got a pair of nice football. But the problem is, and I think people saw it in the West Brom game, they can't stop leaking goals. They give away silly goals regularly. And, and I think they might end up sleepwalking into a sort of relegation battle. I don't know what you think about this, Kieran. But about Brighton, do you reckon they'll stay up or...? On paper, I look at that team and I think they genuinely have enough players, enough quality Premier League players to stay up. And I think the the most important thing when it comes to staying up is you've got to have a striker that finds the back of the net. And they do have Neil Morphe. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was their top scorer last season. Mm. Um, it'd be interesting to see if he can, you know, sort of kick on from there. I don't think he's. I think he's just scored a couple of penalties so far and maybe missed one as well. So it, it's going to be, he is pivotal to them staying up. Um, yeah. I, I think they will be down there. I really do. And I, I think it's, it's more between them and Sheffield United. 
for me than than opposed to bringing Burnley in there. I, I just I look at the squad and I think yes they've had talent and Graham Potter. If you think about Brighton before Graham Potter arrived, they weren't playing the most attractive football and it, and it was by the skin of their teeth and then out of nowhere. Potter sort of revolutionised how they play. They, they switched to that back five with the, the centre-backs who like to bomb forward. Um, keeping Lewis Dunk was huge for them as well. There was rumours of him possibly moving to Chelsea. Um, and I think the addition of Adam Lallana is huge as well. Maybe someone who hasn't had the most game time in recent years, but is still a talented footballer, as we saw at Southampton. Um, So I think they have the players in their team to keep them up. Yeah, so, right, I'm going to go around. Who do you reckon that third team will be? I'll start off with you, Ollie. Who will be that third team? We all know Fulham wants Bromwell going down. Who's that third team? I don't want to say it because it's where I am at university, but they just can't seem to get the ball in the back of the right net. So I'm going to have to say Sheffield. (laughs) Kieran? I'm in agreement. I I, I, really, I can't see it too heavily being anyone else. I mean, now you say about Fulham and West Brom, I think we maybe keep an eye on West Brom because they brought in Carl and Grant. And yeah. He's already scored his first goal and what I said about, you know, having a, a striker that finds the back of the net to keep you up. So it'd be interesting to see how he does it true. in regards to whether he can find the back of the net a bit more consistently. I mean, that is true. I mean, if, if West Brom do keep picking up form, I mean, God knows. I mean, that throws kind of every, everyone for a loop. I, I still think, I just think it's going to be Burnley. I, I can't, the mentality, the short and unhappy manager, when you, the guy you look to who's been there for so many years, the, the one figure there that has been driving that club forward. I mean, it, their, play, their squad on paper, again, isn't the best thing. And with, I think, the long-term, long-term injuries to their centre-backs, I want to say Tarkowski's out for a, a while at least, or, or him or Ben Me. I just feel like they might put themselves in a situation where they need to do so much work that they can't do it in time and then they end up going down. I think that's what makes this season so exciting though. I mean, at both ends of the table, unlike last season, the season's gone. I mean, this year is so tight. I mean, normally you've got the main people going for the title, you've got the main people going for relegation, but I mean, both ends of the table is, is still up in the air, really. Like you just said, apart from Fulham, yeah. you don't know who's going down. <laughs> there could be, could be any of 16. So, I mean, I think that's why this year in the Premier League could be one of the best yet. Moving on from one unhappy manager in the form of Sean Dyche to Oli Gunnar Solskjaer at Manchester United. He did not have the window he wanted, clearly. Everybody knows that. But two players really in the headlines for Man United, Edison Cavani and Donny van der Beek. Nathan, what are you thinking? First of all, Cavani made his debut the other day. What do you think that's going to be? Uh, um, Cavani was a weird one because they definitely need a striker. If you're going and trying to get top four, Regalo is your backup in big trouble but and he did look sharp when he come on he hadn't played for seven months and looked pretty sharp against Chelsea I think all in all that's a good signing even though I had I do have doubts about how good Cavani being it's not a very long term thinking signing albeit they did sign those two youngsters the Euro going one and then Traore um, and then Donny van der Beek is again is it's a good signing Donny, Donny van der Beek's a good player then no one can doubt that he's a, but he's been brought into a position where you've already got Pogba Fernandez. if you're going to play the three with Donny Van Beek in there, your defence has to be better. And I mean, Tellers was a fantastic bit of business on the left back side because you need a left back. But centre, I mean, there's still so many holes in that Man United team. And still, depth, depth's still the issue. And I don't think they've addressed that as much as they should have. Everyone is saying at the moment that Cavani was a panic buy. But everyone knew that Man United needed to sign someone that can get them goals. And outside of Ronaldo and Messi in the whole of Europe, Cavani is the number one goal scorer in the past few years. So, have Man United not done exactly what the fans wanted, Kieran? It, I mean, at the end of the day, regardless of his record, it was a panic buy. I do, I do agree that it is a good signing. Um, he's got European pedigree at clubs like clubs like Napoli, PSG. He's a fantastic striker. And you could argue that, you know, maybe his yes, best years are behind him, but he was still posing some good numbers, even going past 30. So, I, I would love to see how Solskjaer uses him. Whether it's going to be a straight battle between him and Martial for that number, number nine starting position, um, whether or whether he plays in, in the cup competitions or whether he comes on in games like the Chelsea one, where you need a bit of spark up front in the last 30 or so minutes. Um, I 
don't even want to imagine what his wages are. Um, it, in terms of, well, this is what we saw with, with Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Um, came in for the, what, the one or two seasons. Yes, he was, he was impressive. Um, but it's, it's short-term thinking at the end of the day. And right now, I don't think United are in a position to challenge for the title. Um, top four, yes, absolutely. I think there's 10, 10 teams that can challenge for top four realistically this season with the squads and the starts they've had. But it, it did seem like a short-sighted signing. Um, but then you look at the two youngsters as well and you think they have the potential to go on and do great things at the club. But you can't ignore the fact when you talk about United transfer window, the fact that, that you failed to sign Jim Sancho. I mean, that's the biggest point probably from the window in regards to a signing that didn't happen. And it could have been quite easy that the Cavani signing was just a, to sugarcoat that, to gloss over the fact that, that Sancho's didn't happen. Um, like I said, I do think it's a great signing. I just worry about its short-sightedness. Look, no one can dispute he's a great goal scorer, but at the same time, he is no Sancho. United didn't get their priority signing. And I mean, mm -hmm. you can probably look at recent figures saying that they've so far lost £70 million from um, coronavirus and they're set to lose over £100 million from coronavirus, which is one of the worst in the Premier League. So maybe that is the reason why I didn't get Sancho. But in terms of Cavani, I mean, from his first debut, he looked sharp. His first touch of the ball nearly resulted in a goal. But in the same way as Ibra came in, brought in to sort of, you know, mentor the youth, and Rashford said how big of an impact he had um, on his career. Um, Nathan, do you think Cavani could have the same sort of impact? I mean, he played alongside Ibra, so he's going to have that from Ibra. And he's also a great player himself. Yeah, I think so. I mean, no one's quite the character that Zlatan is. I mean, no one's going to have that impact on a club. I mean, Zlatan joined AC Milan and now they're the best team in Europe for all guys. But Cavani, I mean, he's good. But I mean, what more do you want as someone to look up to a young striker? I don't know who like the under-23 players are at Man United coming through. But someone like, you know, Marcus Rashford even, who's I know he's 22 now, but he can look at Cavani and improve his finishing game. And same with Martial, all those players. And I mean, it can only be... These sort of signs in sort of football terms can only really be a good thing in the training ground because you look working with someone that has learned so much, has so, has done so much. But again, like Kieran said, the short sightedness of it means it could benefit. I mean, we'll see in a few years if it benefits like players, the other strikers at Manchester United. But going back to the, the point before, what Kieran said about Sancho, I think when Man United put their eggs, they all put their eggs into one basket. We're getting Sancho, we're getting Sancho. This is it, this is it, right? You know, this is the one we're going for. And then they didn't get it. So it would always put uh, such a big, like, problem in your transfer window if you can't get the one person you prioritise this whole time. And you've been... Because Man United have had this problem for years. I don't know what you think about this, Ollie, but clubs seem to negotiate a bit higher when Man United are involved. They, you know, Sancho, 120 million. I don't know if he's worth that. I know he's English, young English talent, but, you know, apart from Joao Felix, who else has ever gone for that? Wow. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I think, you know, that the problem with that, but going back to the Cavani question, I think, yeah, Cavani will help out the training, for sure. Everyone knows that Man United like to spend big. I mean, I think Man United like to do it just to, just to set records. I think sometimes they're like, <laughs> well, I'll chuck 10 million on just to break a record instead of needing to. But, I mean, Cavani was brought in for free and he's already been brought in on probably his first proper game that he could have because he needs to get fit. But one player that they spent £40 million on and, you know, they got it done really quickly and it wasn't a last-minute panic buy as such was Donny van der Beek. And yet, where even is he? He's not even in the squad. Like, he could have came on against Chelsea. You know, he came on on his debut. He scored a goal. Um, he's done well in the games he's been playing in. He's got an 83% passing um, success rate, which is higher than Paul Pogba. Um, so why is he not playing, Kieran? The balance in, in the United midfield is, is an interesting one. In that you look at three players in Scott McTominay, Fred and Emmanuel Matic. And then you've got the three players who arguably would be more in the more attacking side of the midfield. In Paul Popper, Bruno Fernandes and the aforementioned Van der Beek. And you look at that and in terms, on a scale of talent and footballers, you're comfortably put in the three more attacking midfielders above the three more defensive midfielders. But you can't play like that. You can't field a midfield with three either box-to-box -box or attacking midfielders who like to get forward because there is going to be a massive gap between the midfield and the defence. 
And with your defence already being quite ropey so far this season, that's the last thing you want. So you need to have someone in there who can provide the balance, which means that one of Van der Beek, Bruno or Pogba miss out. And in this case, more recently, it's been both Pogba and Van der Beek. Both, both have been finding themselves on the bench. Pogba has had the opportunities from the bench in sort of the last 30 minutes. But I think sooner rather than later, Solskjaer needs to find a balance of how he can get the best out of his more attacking players while also still having more defensive players to balance out that midfield. So Van der Beek, I mean, at the end of the day, he, he needs to play. He is a player that you want to start in your team, as are all three of the midfielders that you have going forward. The problem is you can only field 11 players and it's it's somewhat unrealistic to use all of those players in their best position. Um, so realistically, um, at the moment, it is a failed signing because you've signed a first team quality player um, and although he is adding to the squad depth, he's not a squad depth player. He, he, for the money you paid for him, he needs, he needs minutes. I mean, Gary Neville said it against the Chelsea game. They said, if you look at United's bench, it looks one hell of a team. Pogba uh, and the beak on the bench with Cavani there as well. But I mean, maybe United have taken it a bit too literally in terms of squad depth and they're putting all the best players on the bench and putting out a weaker team to make himself look better. I don't know, but I mean, Van der Beek needs to be playing and Cavani, who knows what sort of signing will turn out to be. And, and finally, just our final talking point of this podcast, we can't talk about the Premier League and not talk about the ridiculous things that are going on at the other end compared to where we started at the bottom, at the top of the table. There's three teams in that top six who, um, let's just say you wouldn't normally see them there. Uh, you've got Everton, who are actually top of the table, Aston Villa in third, and then Leeds occupying that final sixth position place. Obviously, there are factors in why this is happening. But could it be down to the fact that the recruitment all the clubs have done has been superb? Or is it the fact that there are some big six teams out there who've just had not the best start to the season? Nathan, what, what, do, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's very team dependent. I think with Everton, that, that Everton are a serious team this year. And I mean, when you bring in a manager of Carlo Ancelotti's standards, someone that has won Champions League, won League titles for his whole career, it's what he does. He's won the Premier League before then something that's going to change, the standard's going to change. The three midfielders they brought in, Alan, Decor and Rodriguez, I mean, that is that is some spectacular business for any team. If any top six club did that business, you'd think, oh my, no, they really want this this year. So I do think that Everton will probably have a substantial chance of actually being in the top four come when the season ends, especially with the starts of Man United, Man City. They've just not been very good. So I, I do think Everton this year actually have a proper chance do worry if they do get an injury to Hamez or Calvert-Lewin, how good they'll be. I'm not sure about their, their depth, perhaps. I don't think Sigurdsson particularly great, nor is Awobi. Then up front, actually, Moyes Keane's gone out on loan. I can't think of who they're back. I'm sure they put Richarlison there. But um, aside from that, with Villa, I think the same. With Villa, I think they're having a good season. Fantastic start, great attack. They're defending really well. I do think they'll fizzle out. I think Dean Smith has proven in his time as a manager to be quite streaky. So for one minute, they're, they're obviously excellent. Hence the you know, 7-2 against Liverpool. And then you have the in the times where they're not so good last season, where they were down at the bottom for so long. And then when you move to Leeds, Leeds you just don't know. I mean, Bielsa is unpredictable. You never know with Leeds. Leeds could be sick this rest of the season. Leeds could probably go on a streak and go down. They're just so unpredictable. I could not tell you what Leeds are going to do, but they're sure fun to watch. And, and looking at the teams that they're sort of replacing, you've got Chelsea, Arsenal, Manchester City and Manchester United all in sort of the bottom half of the table. These teams have, have done some recruitment, a lot of recruitment, to be fair, and they've got players in who have that world-class potential. So, Ollie, why are they why are they flauntering so much at the start of this season? I mean, firstly, you cannot dispute the great start that the likes of Everton, Aston Villa and Leeds are having. But at the same time, you do have to think about how poor a start the normal so-called top six are having. They would not be there, probably not be there anyway if it wasn't for the poor starts that those teams have had. And you can tell and say they've had a poor start because they haven't picked up the points against those teams. But I don't think on a normal season, if these so-called big big teams had a, a good start, that they would be there. For, I mean, Chelsea, yeah, they brought in quality players, but maybe they've oversigned. Maybe they brought in too many players in too short of a time that they just can't, you know, get to grips with how each other play. I think that if Chelsea brought in, you know, three players this season, three players next season, that it would be a completely different story. 
but they've really bulk buyed and I don't think that's worked for them. United, as we said, they didn't really sign many players and the players they have signed aren't in the starting lineup. Man City, they, they invested and they probably invested wisely. They didn't bulk buy like Chelsea have, but it's just not working for them. Um, and Arsenal, I mean, you know, they did some good business. Um, Partey in midfield on deadline day was, was a great signing, but they're just not playing well. And I don't think anyone can pinpoint exactly why they aren't playing well. But I mean, you've got to think, if these big teams were playing at the standards they can, Everton wouldn't be top of the table. I mean, Aston Villa wouldn't be third. Aston Villa have got a good squad. Granted, they've made good signings. But a squad to be in third place? I don't think so. And, and something that probably goes under the radar a bit as well is two teams that aren't in the top six are actually in seventh and eighth. None of the aforementioned four teams who would normally be in the top six occupy seventh and eighth. That goes to Southampton and Crystal Palace. So I think it's just a testament to, to how well they're doing as well in, in terms of Ralph Hurst and, and Roy Hodgson. Um, Nathan, what, why do you think that is that those teams who normally sort of flounder in mid to ta- mid table, maybe in the relegation battles, have picked up some really good points recently? Um, I think Southampton have always been one of those teams that will, you know, lose free, win free, sort of how, how they are. They had such an awful start. They were looked really poor. And you're thinking, because everyone had such high expectations, they had a really good lockdown, like post-lockdown period. And then they come back and they lose their, or they struggle in their first three. And now they're, they're fantastic. And I think Southampton, Southampton, you've got a fantastic side there. A lot of young players. Danny Ings is probably one of the best strikers in the Premier League right now. Shay Adams is coming into his own. Stuart Armstrong seems to be one of the players that rarely gets talked about, but is doing a fantastic job there. But um, I think with Southampton, I think, They'll they'll probably level out around that because they've got a good manager with a modern you know sort of modern thinking when it comes to tactics. When that's the difference between them and Crystal Palace, I don't think Crystal Palace will stay where they are because while Roy, I really rate Roy, which I think is a fantastic manager, but the way they play, they tend to take their chances. Just about, I mean, with the Fulham game, Fulham dominated that game really, and Crystal Palace hit them on the break. That won't work against the Liverpool. That won't even that won't work against them. That won't work against the sort of bigger sides. Who are going to put them under pressure and actually have the quality to finish them off? Because they gave up chances against Fulham, they're going to give up chances against other teams. So, and the way Palace play, it's very possession-based. There, obviously, a lot goes through Zaha. So, if you can take Zaha up the game, like most teams managed to do last season, you kind of take off Crystal Palace's attacking threat. I mean, the Championship is normally the league that's called the unpredictable one, the one that you just you have no idea what's going to happen. And sometimes the Premier League is is, oh, well, Liverpool are playing this team, they're going to batter them. Man City are playing this team, they're going to batter them. But <laughs> there's a game this Sunday between Aston Villa and Southampton. That's third v seventh. Now, normally, I would have no interest in watching this game. But I'm looking at that and I'm looking at their form and I'm looking at their squads and I'm like, I'm definitely making sure I watch this game. So do you think as well, Oli, in, in terms of what fans will want to watch, there's going to be more interest in the games that would normally just fade into the background? I mean, I'll come back to that question. But first of all, to go on to the Crystal Palace thing with Nathan saying that it wouldn't work against big teams. Roy Hodgson set out his team against Fulham in the same way he set them out against Man United to counter-attack them. You sit back, take the pressure, and then you counter-attack. And saying it wouldn't work against a big side, it worked against Man United. Against Fulham and Man United, they've had around 30% of possession. They were out-possessed in terms of touches on the ball. But they still got the result they wanted. So I think in terms of Crystal Palace saying, you don't think they'll say that, I think they certainly could. I think with Zaha retaining him, they're def- I think they could be between 7th and 10th this season. Um, so yeah, I just think they're saying they couldn't do it against top six team. Yeah, United weren't playing well at all. But I mean, they still beat them. So we can't take that away from them. Yeah, um, no, I think, so just to counteract that, I do think, I think you, if you're so clinical all the time, that, that's only for a certain time. You're not always going to, you know, you have lots of shots. I mean, Chris Pazza are a good side, very disciplined. James McArthur is one of those great players in the Premier League. But I just feel like the way they play, it's only going to be set up some games. Some games, they're going to get absolutely battered, you know, the way they set up. And it's not the way, if they're having 30% possession, you're having, you know, maybe three, four shots a game. There's a time where that luck starts to run out. It starts to... You know, the, instead of you getting that goal on the counter attack, they're scoring first, and then you're chasing the game. And if you're so used to sitting back, being disciplined, having to chase a game is is just a different scenario for them that they've not had to attack before. But who knows with Palace? I mean, they could finish that. I could be wrong. You know, they could be they could finish eighth, ninth, tenth. 
but I just feel like they might have found her out a little bit and the that book. Going back to the original question there, Kieran, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's all right. I think it's going to be a really interesting game. I mean, even without their current form now, I mean, if you look at the past three meetings between the two teams, there's been 12 goals in three games. That's a lot of goals. And that's without them being in the positions that they are now. So I think it's going to be one hell of a game to watch. I really do. I think it's two managers that are getting their teams playing really well. I think it's two managers that tactically know the strengths of their teams, which really works. Um, and I think, for instance, like Chelsea, Lampard still trying to figure out that. Maybe another reason why they're not doing great. But I mean, I think Southampton will win. I think despite them being below Aston Villa, Southampton will win. I think Aston Villa, I think they're not going to be anywhere near where they are now come the end of the season. No disrespect to them. I think you will start to see them them fading off a little bit. Um, I mean, they got battered last game against Leeds, 3-0. Um, and Leeds, despite playing well, haven't been, despite where they are, haven't been getting amazing results. I mean, they've been playing great football, but still losing. So I think Aston Villa had that great result, obviously, against uh, Leicester and against Liverpool. But I think that Southampton um, are really going to be the team to to win this game. And I think that Southampton really could set, you know, set the marker for the teams around them this season. I think they, they will probably finish where they are now in seventh position sort of thing. Well, either way, regardless of just that game, it's just going to be another exciting weekend of Premier League football. One that... Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Who knows how many goals there'll be? Um, all I know is that I'm excited. I'm guessing you two are as well. 100%. It's going to be a great weekend. And that wraps up our first ever One Two Football podcast. Thanks for listening. Before you go, make sure to check out our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at One Two Football UK, and take a look at One Two Football.com for all the latest written pieces from our growing list of contributors from around the world. We'll see you next week. See you soon. Bye.